Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing um, a writer-producer um, in the world of comedy slash horror slash exploitation and mainstream. His name is Steve Haberman. He's best known for co-writing Life Stinks and Dracula Dead and Loving It for Mel Brooks, but he also uh, worked at New World Pictures as a pictorial and visual consultant on such pictures as Transylvania 65000, Body Rock, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Return to Horror High, and all those. And I'm having him on the show today, and I'm just ecstatic and stuff because... I've always been, I've always been, he's, he's had a very interesting path into the world of film, and I want to find out a little bit more about how he got there and stuff, because I just love the movies that uh, he's been a part of. So yeah, here is my interview with Steve Haberman. Hey, Steve. Hey, Tom, you saw him a little late. Uh, it's okay, it happens every now and then. <laughs> Uh, it's such an honor. I appreciate you taking the time today. No problem. Now, how do you do this? You record this, and then where do you put it? I put it on YouTube. You just stick it on YouTube, huh? Okay. Yeah. Who listens to it? Um, people who s subscribe to my channel, random people out there, mostly people who are into, like, horror in the 80s and stuff like that. And there's a lot of these people? Not, not as many as I like, but there's a lot, yeah. And you do stand-up, right? Yes, I do. Are you funny? That's all subjective. <laughs> well, it was too long of a gap before you answered that. You should say, yes, I'm very funny. I'm very funny, but, I, you know, but comedy is subjective. You know, what my cup of tea might be may not be yours or this person or that person, you know, but... Who are your influences as a comedian? Uh, you know, that's funny... A lot of the guys you've worked with, like Mel Brooks and stuff, I love them. Uh, I love the um, the old time performers when I was a kid. But as far as stand up, I love um, Sam Kinison, Andrew Dice Clay, Bobcat Goldthwait, the really edgy rock and roll type of comedians. Oh, I love Kinison. I thought he was great. I, I'm friends with. I used to be closer to, to his best friend, a guy named Carl LeBeau. Yeah. Yeah, he died in Carl LeBeau's lap, basically. You know. Yeah. Uh, Carl was in the the, uh, the car behind him, and uh, I remember him calling me that night because I thought Sam. I'm not crazy about Andrew Dice Clay and those some of those guys. They're just to me just dirty. But I yeah. think Sam was brilliant. I mean, he was a brilliant, honest, uh, piercing sort of uh, commentator in the '80s, and he really he really had a you know a point of view that was. Uh, that was personal, but it was also identifiable, and it was totally politically incorrect. I don't think I don't know what Sam would do now. Yeah, I don't know if he'd have a career, or if he'd change, you know, history. I don't know. Probably he'd change history, knowing him. Yeah, and then funny thing is too, um, <clears throat> my dad and my uncles, you know, they're the same. They're the same age as him. They got they got me into him really, really early on because even though I mean they grew up on Pryor and Carlin and all those guys. They, they they could really identify with what Kinison was talking about because it was their generation, you know, with, you know, Vietnam and um, wh whatever was going on. Yeah, whatever what was going on in the world, they could really identify with him. And he, like, spoke to their generation. And I think yeah. it, it's it's great, you know. And also he was uh, – he had a strange upbringing because he was a, a, an evangelical preacher. Yep. And uh, – and he never like he never renounced that he 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 was he had a lot of faith you know in his own crazy rock and roll way and uh, it made it cool you know it kind of made it cool and he was also a big Reagan supporter yeah he was like a a, a conservative a political conservative and a Christian and yet he was this not really foul mouthed but kind of angry rock and roll comic it was very interesting combination I, I really miss him and there's no nobody has come along like him I also worked with the guy who <laughs> whose directing career Sam Kennison destroyed this guy named Alan Metter I was his yeah. visual consultant on his first movie which was uh, Girls Just Want to Have Fun right and Alan 
uh, did uh, some movies with Roger, Ro- Rodney Dangerfield that were hits, and then mm-hmm. he uh, he was supposed to direct the first Sam Kennison movie. And what happened was, you know, when you make a movie of Warner Brothers, it's got to be pretty well worked out before the first day of shooting. Right. And Sam didn't get that memo. <laughs> so what <laughs> happened was that uh, Alan Bennett, they had the script, and they, you know, you cast it, you find the locations, and you build the sets and everything. And on the first day, Sam shows up late, and he's got his own script. He says, I, you listen, over the weekend I rewrote the script. He says, this is, this, your script sucks. But he says, this is going to be great. This is going to be a big hit. We're, he says, Sam, it doesn't work like that. You know? Yeah. We're, we're scheduled to shoot the script you agreed to do. No, no, I know. They closed it on the first day. They closed it. It was a disaster. It was a disaster for Sam, and it was a disaster for Alan Better. Yeah, you're, ta- you're telling the Atuk story, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that. you know, that's, a, that's one of those mythology movies that's you know because it was it was supposed to be Belushi and then Sam and then John Candy then Chris Farley and it's just it's a really cursed project right. that never got made you know right. right but yeah maybe the world was better for without it <laughs> yeah all it was basically was like a crocodile Dundee type of story right you know but going back to the beginning I mean did you fall in love with film early on I needed movies because I grew up uh, in a uh, lower middle class, shall we say, uh, family in Long Beach, California. And both my parents were alcoholics. As a matter of fact, my mom died of, of cirrhosis of the liver when I was about 20. Oh, and I sorry. found out that my father was not my father, that he was some guy that my mom married after she had me illegitimately. To this day, I don't know who my father was. But I didn't know any of that. I just knew that my parents were, you know, moody, should we say. <laughs> and so what I did was I, uh, I watched uh, a lot of television, and I fell in love with the Universal Horror Classics on TV. Because they, in those days, they would show them with, with commercials. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like twice, they'd, there'd be like a double feature on Saturday and a double feature on Sunday, I think. And then there was a thing called Million Dollar Movie that where they would show the same movie every night for five nights and then twice on Saturday and twice on Sunday. And some of the movies were like House of Wax, you know, or, you know, all kinds of interesting movies, Godzilla. And uh, so I got to see uh, see them many, many times, and I kind of obsessed on them. It was, a, it was an escape. You know, what I did was, when I was a kid, I looked around and I realized life sucks, but movies are great. <laughs> so I wanted to spend most of my time watching movies, and that's what I did. Nice, yeah. Back, at, yeah. Those back before uh, VHS and all that, you had the the Late Show, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there were commercials, and they were crummy prints and everything. But we were, I was, just thrilled to have them because. And I went to the movies, you know. My friends, I had a friend from about the age of three till we stopped speaking sometime in our early twenties. Yeah. And um, his parents were really nice to me. They must have felt sorry for me because they used to like take me on the weekends basically starting on Friday night after school and, and I didn't have to come home until, you know, Sunday. And they they were a wonderful Mormon family and they took me to the drive-in and miniature golfing and all this stuff. So I got to see, you know, a lot of the new movies that too in, in the drive-in and I fell in love with those as well. Uh, I just realized movies were better than real life. They are, aren't they? I'm, I'm not mistaken in that, am I? No, you're not. <laughs> no. I get a lot of agreement in universities when I say that. Yeah, I miss the old drive-ins too. Um, do, do you remember? The, can you remember the first movie you ever saw? Yes, vividly. My stepfather, whatever he was, Roger Haberman, was a very bad used car dealer. Not dealer, salesman. He was mm-hmm. a used car salesman, and he uh, would get trade in cars. You know, when people would, would trade in their cars as a salesman. And one time, he found an album in the back of a trade in car. And it was the album of Dimitri Tiomkin's soundtrack to the Alamo. Mm-hmm. And it had the sleeve, which was this really beautiful Reynolds Brown painting of the poster from the Alamo, you know, with John Wayne and Lawrence Harvey and, and Richard Whitmark. And he brought this home. Mm-hmm. And I had one of those little turntables. This is vinyl, you know. I had yep. one of these little turntables that was just for kids, you know, just a little individual turntable. And I played this thing, and it, it fascinated me because the music was brilliant. And there were a couple of cuts that were uh, John Wayne saying lines from the movie, saying speeches from the movie, which were written by uh, his favorite writer, uh, John Grant. 
And uh, just, this thing fascinated me. I had to see this movie. So one day I'm walking home from kindergarten because we lived in a neighborhood where the school, where you could walk to the school. It was like three blocks away. And I'm walking mm-hmm. home and my mom's car pulls up and she says, um, I have a surprise for you. I'm going to take you to the movies. I didn't even know what that meant. And I got in the car and she took me downtown Long Beach to the West Coast Theater and I saw the Alamo on the big screen. Wow. Oh my God. Really? You know, they yeah. make stuff like this. I couldn't believe it. With an intermission that, you know, it was in stereo and it was in Todd AO, which was a 70 millimeter process. And I mean, it was, it changed my life. And of course, I knew the music. You know, I knew the music because I listened to it over and over again in my little bedroom. So. In those days, let me tell you something. Mm-hmm. In those days, movies were basically based on either history or literature. They yeah. weren't based on comic books. They weren't based on whim. They were mostly based on literature, and that includes you know contemporary literature right. or or history. And so, going to school and going to the movies and watching TV, it all kind of came together. Right. And instead of it really, instead of divorcing me from real life, I learned a, a lot about the best parts of life, which are, you know, what artists have said in literature and paintings and so on, and uh, what, what happened, what happened in mankind, what happened in the Middle Ages, what happened in the history of this country, what happened, you know, during the wars, because that's what they made movies about. And yeah. so it all came together for me at school, and I did very well at school. I was very, very smart, because... This is where I wanted to put my, my, my attention and my imagination. And so I, I was plotting my escape, you know, from, from this life, from this little house with these alcoholic parents. And my half-brother was, a, uh, shall we say, we had nothing in common. <laughs> and um, so what I decided is I realized that they were, keeping, they were taking my grades down. You know, you'd get a report card. And they took it very seriously, the grown-ups. Mm-hmm. You know, they put them in files and stuff like that. So I figured, this must mean something. Nothing was ever explained to me. Parents in those days weren't your friends, and they didn't explain to you anything. Yeah. They basically, you were seen and not heard. So I decided, if I get good grades in middle school and high school, something good must happen at the end of that, because they're keeping, them, they're keeping records of these. Mm-hmm. Now, when I, I, when I got to the sixth grade, which was elementary school, they, they brought me in and they said, we're, we're changing your school. You're going to go to a brand new experimental program, which is called uh, Accelerated Sixth Grade. And what it is, is it's for the smart kids, basically, and it's preparing you for, in those days, what was called junior high, which we now call middle school, I guess. And uh, they said, so... Um, you know, you've done very well, you've tested very well, and you're really smart. So we're going to say you have to walk a little bit further across Stearns and into the other neighborhood to go to uh, sixth grade, but that's what we're going to do. So so I said, okay. So, um, and my parents, of course, were excited about that and proud of me. The colonel, who was not even really my father, he was a colonel in uh, World War II in the Marines, and he distinguished himself quite a lot at Guadalcanal. He was a fighter ace. Mm-hmm. And he shot down a lot of Japanese aircraft. And so and now he's an alcoholic uh, used car salesman. But, you know, those were and – he, and he had gone to college, and he was, he was kind of proud of me. And so I went to uh, this other school, Prisk, and I did sixth grade. They're accelerated, and they broke it up like, like junior high in classes. And so by the time I got to middle school, I was kind of prepared anyway – Make a long story short, I got straight A's all the way through junior high and high school. Mm-hmm. And on my last year, my senior year in high school, my counselor brought me in and said, Steve, uh, you got 4.0, and so you have won the Bank of America Achievement Award in English and math and science and the arts. It's never been done before. You won all three of those. So you can literally go anywhere to college, and it will be paid for. You can study anything you like, and we'll even do the paperwork for you. So I already knew what I wanted to do. I said, okay, I want to go to USC Cinema. They said, done. And I did. They sent me to USC Cinema free for four years, Mm -hmm. and I did very well there, and I sort of distinguished myself at USC, and I 
had this legendary uh, screenwriting teacher, a guy named Erwin Blacker, who had been the screenwriting teacher previously for George Lucas and John Milius mm -hmm. and uh, Marwood and Robbins and, you know, all those guys who went to USC in the golden era. And he was on his last leg when I had it, but he really liked me and he liked my work. So he got me an agent. I actually had an agent of William Morris while I was at USC, and I was getting scripts optioned. And so I, I took this money, and I realized that if you made a movie at USC, they paid for the equipment, and they paid for the film stock and all and the processing, because there was no digital in those days. We shot on 16 millimeter. Right. They owned it. So when you made your student film, if you made THX 1138 like Lucas did, they owned it, and they got to keep the awards. So I thought, no. Oh, my God. So I took the money that I was making on by auctioning scripts, and I made my own short film, which was called Blind Curves. It was a half-hour film, and uh, I wrote it, produced it, directed it. It was it was quite suspenseful and good. It was like a little sort of color, spectacular episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and it won all of these film festivals. As a matter of fact, CINE, which was the Council, Council on International Non-Theatrical Events in Washington, D.C. It's called CINE, C-I-N-E. They chose it as the film of the year to represent the United States in foreign film festivals for student films or amateur films, whatever they call it. And I won 17 of those. So uh, by the time I was finished at USC, I was doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so um, somebody, a, a producer by the name of Don Barron, saw my, saw my short film, Blind Curves, and he thought it was very slick, which it was. And he was producing a breakdancing movie called Body Rock. And he right. was work, working with a first-time uh, director by the name of Marcello Epstein. Yep. And nobody had any faith in this guy. He was a very good music video director. Music video was like a new art form at this time, right? Right. And, and he distinguished himself at that. But they didn't know if he could like shoot a scene with people talking, you know, or you know, walking <laughs> down the street or something. So they saw my film and they thought it was really slick and they hired me as a visual consultant. Right. This guy, who was a very nice guy, by the way, Marcello Epstein. I don't know what ever happened to him, but he was a very nice guy. And what I did was I broke this, the movie into shots in prose with him. Mm -hmm. And I went on all the location scouts and I, I talked to the, the set designers and I, and I storyboarded the really visual scenes, which were basically the dance. I went to the choreographed sessions with the dancers and so on. And I was on the set. And I would like whisper into his ear, don't put the camera there, put it over there, and you know, stuff like that. So, just by luck, on the last day of filming uh, in the studio, that afternoon at four o'clock, everybody had to get in vans and go to LAX, and then we were gonna fly to New York and, and do the exteriors, because it was supposed to take place in New York, right? Right. And uh, on that last day, we had a dance scene, and we didn't have time to do it. We'd gone slightly over schedule. And it was very elaborate, it involved like, dancers in skeleton costumes and smoke and black light and all this. Mm -hmm. And our DP was the great Robbie Mueller, who just died this year. He was the yeah. DP. How they got him, I don't know. But anyway, um, I had storyboarded that scene. And they were all in a panic, and everybody was there. The producer, Chuck Russell, who went on to direct The Mask and Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and stuff. And uh, Jeff Sheckman, who was the head of New World Pictures. Anyway, they were all there, and I said, look, if we put the camera on a crane, I will go out and we'll walk through the dance scene and I'll put marks on the floor because there's be, going to be smoke on the floor mm -hmm. where the crane should stop for the dancers. And we'll get like three or four crane shots like that. And then we'll go in for cross coverage on those spots where I mark where the crane stop. And let's see how far we get. At least we'll get three or four crane shots of the whole dance scene. And so Robbie Miller says, ah, this is a good idea. This is the best idea of VFR to be able to do this. Well, they did it, and it worked. We had we got all the coverage we needed in the time, and there was like 45 minutes to, you know, pop the cork on some champagne. And everybody got in the van and went to New York. And I did that in front of Jeff Sheckman and Chuck Russell. So ever after, I was hired as visual consultant on any movie where somebody came from commercials or from sitcoms or something that had, they'd never done a feature before. Mm -hmm. Somehow they were attached to the script. And so at New World and other companies like that, these B-movie companies, I would go in and I would be the visual consultant. Well, one of the guys that I did that for was a writer by the name
name of Rudy DeLuca. Yep. Rudy DeLuca was the writing partner of Barry Levinson. They'd been writing partners for 14 years. Right. And they'd written the Carol Burnett show and won a couple of Emmys. And then Mel Brooks called them in and they wrote High Anxiety and Silent Movie with Mel. And so um, what happened was uh, they hired me to be Rudy's visual consultant because he was going to direct his first movie because Barry had gone off to direct Diner and The Natural, I think, by this point. Yeah. And, and um, so Rudy was going to direct his, his first feature, Transylvania 6 5000, which he wrote in Yugoslavia with this wonderful cast, Jeff Goldblum and Ed Bagley Jr. and Gina Davis and Joe Bologna and Carol Kane. They had a terrific cast. Yep. So, so I go to, uh, to Yugoslavia with Rudy DeLuca, and Rudy, I mean, if he were here, he would back me up. He can't direct you to the bathroom in your own home. He just doesn't, that's not his skill. <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a writer. He's a joke writer. He's a comedy writer. Right. And he didn't enjoy directing at all. It freaked him out. So I helped him out a lot, right? right. And um, so we come home, and the movie comes out, and it's a hit. It's like a $3 million movie, and it makes like $9 million, which was a nice, substantial hit in those days. Mm -hmm. And so Rudy says to me, and Rudy's like twice my age at least, and he says, uh, do you want to be my writing partner? Because we had been pretty close, you know, for mm -hmm. 10 weeks in Yugoslavia. So I said, yeah. So I become Rudy DeLuca's writing partner. His previous writing partner was Barry Levinson. So... Um, so we're working up in Rudy's house, and uh, Mel Brooks calls Rudy mm -hmm. and asks him if he has anything. And Rudy says no. And Mel says, well, I don't have anything. Rudy, had, I mean, Mel had just made baseballs. And I said, I have something. And so um, I go in and I pitch him Life Stinks, and the rest is history. Oh, wow. That is amazing. Um yeah, Transylvania 65000 was a huge staple in my house when I was growing up. I still watch it today and quote it. I love it. You know, you, you know what I found out uh, recently is um, the guy who uh, the guy who plays um, the inspector in the movie just died not too long ago. He did? Yeah. Oh, you mean the, the – oh, not the mayor, the inspector. Oh, yeah, 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 the Yugoslavian guy, yeah. I, I, I had heard that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I remember uh, listening to the commentary track you and Rudy did for the DVD, and uh, Rudy had said that uh, that he heard from him, like, years later and, and, and told him that uh, he got a little bit of fame off of that movie in, in Yugoslavia. Well, you know, everybody wanted out of Yugoslavia. Well, that was behind the Iron Curtain. There was no such thing as Yugoslavia anymore. But yeah. when we were there, um, they all wanted us to, you know, put, us in their, put them in our suitcases and take them home because... You know, they were suffering under communism. They hated it. They wanted to come to, to America like everybody does. And, you know, you wanted to, they were all sweet people, too. But they all hated each other. That's what was weird. <laughs> they, they were very tribal. You know, that's like the Serbs hated the Croatians, and the Croatians hated the Serbs. And <laughs> yeah. Then there's the Serbo-Croatians. They hated them, and everybody hated the Jews. I mean, like, it was so much hatred over there. I thought, well, no wonder this place is collapsing. Yeah. I'm I'm uh, half Croatian on my dad's side, and we we don't know too much about our family history or about Croatians. When I first started doing stand up, I tried to make fun of Croatians, but not everybody got it, so I stopped yeah, doing it. Yeah. <laughs> now they're all it's Bosnia and and these different countries, you know. It's just mm -hmm. it all split up, and but at the time it was a pretty interesting experience for a kid. Yeah, it must have been beautiful over there. We yeah. shot in this castle and a village. That's a village. We didn't shoot that at Universal Backlot. That's a that's an actual village in Yugoslavia with cobblestones and you know horse drawn carts and women you know putting sticks on their back and walking through the fields. It, it, it was like medieval. Yeah. There, but fascinating because I was already interested in Gothic horror, so this was I was at home. Yeah, it looked like it was freezing cold too. It got cold at night, and we shot some nights all night long. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then you, after you did that, uh, you were a storyboard artist on Return to Horror High. Yeah, I don't remember that too much. I, I remember somebody called, I think it was one of the guys, or one, maybe one of the women that I worked for 
when I was a visual consultant, and they called me up for this with the same, oh, we've got this director, he doesn't know what he's doing, or whatever, will you come and do it? And I said, yeah, but I'm a writer now, I'm writing movies. And they said, well, come on, just do it, it'll be easy for you. So I think that's what happened. I went and I, yeah, did that. I did a couple like that. There was another one, Midnight Blue or something, where I did yeah. the same thing. And they, they, they couldn't give me, like, visual consultant salary or, 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 or billing for some reason. And I said, oh, don't worry. Just say I did the storyboards. Yeah, I interviewed one of the main actresses uh, from the movie, Lori Lethan. She told me it was uh, one of the most pleasant experiences she had making a movie. Which one? Uh, Return to Horror High. Oh, yeah. That was in the high school, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that, sort of. Yeah. So how did you come up with uh, Life Stinks? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I thought that it was time to remake a Preston Sturgis movie called uh, Sullivan's Travels. And because it was, it was, we were coming off of the Reagan era, and like now, there was a real huge <laughs> disparity between wealth and poverty in the United States. Not since, and what, from what I knew, looking around, it, it looked like about the, the same as the Great Depression. That's what the disparity between wealth and poverty was in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. So uh, I thought it would be a good idea to rethink and remake Sullivan's Travels, which is about a a wealthy movie director who wants to make a movie about poverty, and in order to find out what it's like, he goes and lives with the poor. But this is in the in the 1930s and early 40s. So, um, so I told that to Mel Brooks, and and then uh, I told him the idea. You know, I said, let's switch it around and make it that a rich guy makes a bet that he can, you know. Uh, stay on the streets for 30 days, and uh, if he can, he, he gets this piece of property that he wants, and he bets with another billionaire who wants the same piece of property, you know, who sort of came up from his bootstraps, but our hero didn't. He was, you know, he's like a, a kind of a Trump-like character. Yeah. And so Mel loved that idea, because I had already discerned what the Mel Brooks theme was, which is that a guy, it, Mel's movies are about the choice between love and money. Yeah, and and it's usually some person, a couple of guys usually, have a, an idea for a crazy scheme to get rich, and they don't get rich. They usually get their asses handed to them, but they fall in love with each other in a sort of non-sexual way. You know, they become a team, and they be, they learn to uh, to appreciate each other. And um, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where I was going with this with this idea, and Mel fell for it immediately. I mean, at the pitch meeting, he slapped the, the table. He says, we're going to make it. And I thought, wow, it's wonderfully easy to sell movies in this town. <laughs> and, uh, and see, Mel has his writers. He, he came up uh, in live TV with Sid Caesar, your show of shows and Caesar right. Power. And those were 90 minutes live. And Sid had his writers every second with him. And Mel was the same way. On a movie, Mel has his writers every second of pre-production, production, and post-production. If Mel's there, you're there. And so, uh, you know, it was quite an experience making Life Sticks because I was always there. I was always with Mel. And uh, it was, there was a lot went on. And, you know, I talked him into actually shooting it on location because it's not a parody. It's not like a Mel Brooks movie. Mel was, you know, doing sort of going back to his roots of the producers and the 12 chairs and making a, a, a comedy about, you know, about his times. Right. And uh, so we shot it on location. And uh, that was challenging because uh, shooting in the ghetto is not a pleasant experience, especially at night. No. Oh. <laughs> the, rat, the rats resent it, you know? Yeah. I, I always like this movie because it's such an admirable departure for Mel because he got to satirize the, the plight of the homeless, but he also got to thought provoke the audience into thinking and knowing that, you know, that what they go through. Well, I'm really proud of that movie, and uh, you know it didn't do well at the box office. I don't, I don't care. It got some good reviews and it got some bad reviews. I agree with the good reviews. I think we did a hell of a job. I think Mel did a hell of a job. And by the way, Mel's crazy about the movie too. He he thinks it's his best performance, and it is. Yes. And uh, and we bonded on that film, and uh, it was 
I think I think it's one of Mel's great movies, and I think uh, in time will time will vindicate it if it hasn't already. Yes, I. Real, I mean that movie is very timely now. In right. The Trump, in, in in the Trump era. Yes, it is. It's, we don't take a political position on it. It just is, you know. Yeah. The, 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 we live in a Darwinian world where some people are talented and make make money, and other people aren't. Doesn't make them bad people, but you know, you this life is much more pleasant. I've been rich and poor, and being rich is way better. Way better. <laughs> yeah, uh, I interviewed Stuart Pankin, and he told me he's pretty um, uh, proud of this movie as well. Yeah, Stuart was great in it too. All of the lawyers were good, but Stuart, of course, as the, as the lawyer spokesman, he was just perfect for it. Just oily and unctuous, and you know, he was. Uriah Heap for the 20th century. Oh, yeah. What was the line? Um, of course we lied to you. We're lawyers. <laughs> you, you cheated me. You took Mr. Bolt. We're lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, was there any notable jokes in the movie that you can take credit for? Uh, well, I'll take care of anything you laugh at. I'll take credit for anything. I mean, look, when you're <laughs> writing with Mel, you don't know who came up with what, really. Because it's a stew, you know? One person says something, and somebody else makes it funnier, and then somebody else ruins it, and then the fourth person comes along. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like um, what am I thinking of? I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a team effort. So you don't really know who came up with exactly what and where it went. But uh, yeah, I remember, but I wouldn't want to say. Let's put it that way. Well, <laughs> the argument between Mel and Rudy about who's richer just kills me every time. Yeah, I mean, that was great. That was great. And the thing is, since they were both in it, yeah. I was kind of directing that scene, and I said, let's try to do it in one, like like the Three Stooges would do. Let's just do it in one two-shot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they start smacking each other, and Mel starts laughing. Not Rudy, Mel starts laughing. Yeah. Right? No, oh, okay, let's try it. We tried it like that. We couldn't get through. We couldn't get through a master without Mel laughing, and so we had to do overs and everything. But it, it worked out anyway. It was hilarious. Oh yeah, it's it's comedy gold. Um, then you guys did Dracula Dead and Loving It. Was that Mel's attempt at trying to do another Young Frankenstein? Well, no. What happened with Dracula Dead and Loving It is that. Um, Mel said to me after Life Stinks, write something for Brooks Films. He says, I'm not just Mel Brooks. I'm a very classy guy. I'm Brooks Films. I produced The Elephant Man and The Fly and 84 Charing Cross Road. You should write something for Brooks Films and direct it. I said, okay. So I wrote this thing, this big science fiction horror movie called Not Human, right? And Mel, God bless him, bought it. Mm -hmm. And he was setting it up. And meanwhile, Rudy and I wrote this thing called Dracula Dead and Loving It. Actually, we originally called it Dracula Dead and Liking It. And, um, you know, I'm coming in once a week or whatever to uh, to talk to Mel about Not Human, and we decided to let Mel read it, right? So we brought it in, we, and Mel goes, oh, yeah, yeah, And he puts it on the corner of his desk, and I'm coming in week after week, and it's in the same corner of his desk. I said, Mel, are you going to read that? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll read it. I'll read it. So one night, about 9.30 at night, when I was about out of money, the phone rings and Mel goes, hey, I read Dracula, we're going to do it, I'm playing Van Helsing, come by for lunch tomorrow, click. So that's that, that's how that started, and of course Mel wanted to, you know, rewrite it, and and, uh, and rightfully so, and so we sat with Mel and we did a, a, a Mel Brooks rewrite, and uh, then that movie got made. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think it, it's very close to the 1931 Bela Lugosi Dracula, but of course with comedy, tried to do is I'm a bit of a scholar on those. I tried to put um, I, tr there, I tried to put the best ideas from each version. Like I like the fact that Renfield goes to Transylvania in the 1931 version, right? And Renfield I, I figured would be the funniest character in Dracula anyway because he's pretty funny when he's straight in the in the real version. Mm -hmm. So so we took that from the 1931 version, and then also I wanted to make Dracula a social character, not a not. Like in the novel, in Stoker's novel, after the, uh, the the first part in Transylvania, Dracula has nothing to say. Mm -hmm. He's a monster. He's like a hissing creature of the night, right? And they they talk about him a lot, but he doesn't appear very often. And uh, 
so I thought, no, let's, let's do that from the 31 version too, which was basically based on the play. Let's have him, you know, come into the drawing room and get to know his victims and so on. And then from the Hammer version of Dracula, the horror of Dracula from 1958, I took the Lucy parts. Right. Because I think that's the best version of the Lucy parts. As a matter of fact, I think the scene in Horror of Dracula, from the moment where Michael Goff comes down into the into the graveyard to, to see if his sister's still, you know, walking around, to the point where, uh, you know, Van Helsing stakes her and then has Michael Goff come over and take a look at her. Now she's at peace and the music. So I think that section of the, like, five, ten minutes of movie is the best part of any vampire movie ever made. Mm-hmm. It's scary, it's atmospheric, it's touching, it's it's spiritual, it's it's got everything going for it. So that, that's the part that we satirized from, from Horror of Dracula. And, of course, the goofy kind of baroque ideas that Coppola had to... To, to style up Dracula, we wanted to, to, to use some of that, like, you know, the flowing robe and the white wig and, and the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, shadow that operates independently from, from its source and stuff like that. We took from that from the Coppola one. And, you know, so we took stuff from everywhere. Mm-hmm. And how come that's, that's been Mel's last movie so far? Well, you know, Mel um, kind of got into Broadway. <laughs> you know, he'd always. Everybody always said you should do a musical of, of the producers, so he did. And my God, it's to this day it won. It has won more Tonys than any show ever on Broadway. It was a gigantic critical and commercial hit, and so he followed that up with with his Young Frankenstein Broadway show, which I think was tremendous. I saw both versions. I saw the Broadway version, which was a little overproduced. You know, it was pretty spectacular. Yeah. I, I had to go to England this year, and he just opened like a cut down version, not cut down in terms of budget or anything, but just streamlined it and, and made it more efficient, which made it even funnier. And I saw that version. That's even better. I mean, that was really terrific. I saw that, I guess, in April in, uh, in London. And uh, so, you know, Mel has been concentrating on on Broadway, and also, you know, he, he let me produce three live shows for HBO with him. Mm-hmm. We got an Emmy nomination for each of those three. Uh, we did uh, Mel Brooks and Dick Cavett together again, Mel Brooks Strikes Back at Mel Brooks Live at the Geffen, and uh, that was a lot of work, you know? I mean, it had to be written, and we shot it and uh, with a live audience, and uh, then, uh, you know, I supervised the editing on those, and then HBO, HBO bought all three of them, and they were very successful. They got great reviews, and, and I got Emmy nominations for each of them. And so That's uh, great. You know, we've been busy doing other things. But the movie business is kind of weird now because, yeah, you know, this, I, I've been very, very fortunate because I never got rewritten. I, I was never in development hell because... I was always working for like one of the last auteurs, one of the last guys where the studio says, well, it's a Mel Brooks movie, so Mel Brooks just make the movie, you know, and we'll pay for it. They don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, everything is by committee now. Everything is way, way overpriced. And, you know, everybody's afraid now, you know, because movies are so expensive that if an executive says yes to anything, his life is on the line. And I mean his mortgage and his kid's, going to university and everything because he could get fired and never work again. So it's a, it's a kind of a scary business. Yeah. Not, not as much fun as I got the very tail end of the tail end of, of old Hollywood where mm-hmm. they trusted you because you'd made some hits and they let you make your movie and they didn't presume to tell you what your movie should be. Right. What ingredients were, I mean, nobody ever told us anything from the studios on the movies that I made with Mel. We just wrote them. When we were happy with them, we shot them, we cut them, they went out and they did what they did. Wow. Yeah, <clears throat> with, with all the jobs you've had in film, have you ever had any desire to direct your own feature-length film? Yeah, that's, what I, that's all I've ever wanted to do, and I never got to do it. I mean, Mel, God bless him, twice bought scripts that I wrote to set up as, for me to direct them, and I never asked him to do that. I never, I never had this conversation that I'm having with you with Mel Brooks. And I was like, gee, Mel, I'd really like to direct something. He said to me, you know what, you got to direct. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he says, write something. So I would write something, and he, he 
would like it. He'd make me make changes, as he does, and buy it and uh, try to set it up. But in in uh, in this atmosphere of Hollywood, it's very difficult. You can either make your own movie for no money, which mm-hmm. now you can actually do. Back in the day, you couldn't do that. I mean, you could shoot a movie on your iPhone now. Yeah. But Or you can make a movie through a studio where they pay for it, but they no longer let you have any freedom, even if you're Mel Brooks. They still are very uh, frightened. And uh, Mel doesn't want to make a movie with an iPhone. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, he has to deal with this crap, and I don't want to put him through that anymore. Yeah, I respect the man tremendously for that. Um, so do you, do you have anything um, in the works you're doing now? Well, right now, here's what I did. I moved out of uh, L.A. I moved up to the mountains, the San Bernardino Mountains. I lived in a three-story brick chateau on Lake Gregory, and uh, I basically didn't want to do any more movie stuff. I wanted to teach, so I've, the last three years I've been working on my Ph.D., and I'm about to do my Viva Voce, where I will get my Ph.D., and I figure with a Ph.D. and three Emmy nominations and a bunch of movies I've written, I'll probably be able to get a pretty nice gig teaching at a beautiful university someplace where, you know, there are seasons. I mean, it's wonderful up here. It snows, and right now it's fall. It's really nice. But Mel called me about hmm. eight months ago. He says, hey, you want to write a script? And I thought he was joking. I said, yeah, yeah, sure. He goes, no, I'm serious. I'm going to send you a book. I want you to adapt it into a movie. I said, all right. So he sent me this book. And uh, I came up with an idea for the story, and I went in, as I used to do, and, and read him the pages, and he liked it and made some changes and so on. So he's, he's trying to set that up as a movie. Not for me to direct, but just as a, as a movie. So those are my two things. i got to finish my thesis and uh, get, do, get my Ph.D. and go teach, and then we'll see if Mel gets uh, this movie set up. Oh yeah, that's 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 great, Steve. Uh, I'm glad you're happy doing what you're doing, though. At least and I do a lot of audio commentaries. Mm-hmm. I noticed a lot of audio commentaries to classic movies. I love doing that. I did one yesterday. I can't tell you what it is because they never want want you to tell. Me. But I've got like uh, four that are coming out. Nice. And they're all classics, all horror classics. Nice, nice. Wow. Yeah. Aside from doing stand up, I also screenwrite too i have this, this horror script i'm i'm trying to get made and stuff and everyone's telling me uh you should get you should uh get get uh somebody who's good with an iphone and do an iphone I'm like this movie is too big for an iphone and too small for a major studio like paramount i need to have like a just like you know some you know independent investors if there is any left over you know to do it well they won't well what you need to do is you're first to right you should do it yourself not necessarily on an iphone yeah you should get a crew together get a guy who's wants to be a dp and has his own you know 4k equipment and uh just do it you know just shoot it yeah try 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 to finance it yourself or you know i don't know rob a bank or you know <laughs> blackmail your parents or whatever you have to do but uh, just finance it yourself and and make it like that because that's where people break in mm-hmm because if you could do it through a studio, which they would want to do it anyway, but if you did, they'd break you. Yeah, that's true. You know, I'm, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they they th- they th- they think that in the future, and I hope they're right because this would be great in the future. There's going to be another independent film revolution, like there was in the '90s with um, Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and all those guys. You yeah, know. It's true. never truly be an art until the uh, material to make it is as cheap as paint and canvas. And it's not, it's not yet, but it's getting there. It's getting there. It's getting to the point where you can make broadcast quality HD images with a phone, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there is going to be, I think maybe in the future, almost all content of any interest is going to be independently made. I think we're going to have independent film artists because mm-hmm. theaters are going to go the way of drive-ins and everybody is going to get their content at home and not necessarily on their TV, maybe on their you know laptop or on their phones. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's really the wave of the future. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good thing. 
because the only way that the studios could come back is if they made movies the way they used to in industrial conditions where they fostered talent and then got out of the way and let people and I in corporate America with the egos and all that I don't think that's ever possible again yeah so the only alternative is for people to make their own movies mm-hmm yeah, and that's just sad and unfortunate, but... It's not sad. It's exciting. I think it's it's a great way. I wish that it had been... I wish I didn't have to uh, make movies on film when I was coming up. Because film's a pain in the ass, even 16 millimeter. You know, you have to have a recorder. You have to shoot negative. You have to have the negative process. You have to cut film. Cut film with tape, you know, and a yeah. razor blade. And tape it together. And you have to conform it to the soundtrack. And you have to then take it to the lab, and they screw it up. Then you have to have the, the, the negative cut to conform. I mean, it was a pain in the ass and extremely expensive. Now, you can shoot sound, and you can shoot film, or digital, whatever you want to call it, at the same time, absolutely beautifully rendered. You can actually mix color and, and, and change right in the camera. I mean, there's so much you can do now that you couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Absolutely. That's the that's that's one good thing. I mean, I like the digital, you know. I'm not so much a big CGI effects guy, but I definitely like the digital how, you know, it's faster to shoot now. Oh yeah, faster to shoot fast. You can cut it on your Mac at home. You know, you get mm-hmm. the Final Cut Pro and that's all you need. Yes, indeed. Well, Steve, I I thank you so much for your time today. Was and- this any good? Oh yeah. Oh my god, you were great. I don't. I don't know if they'll be interested, but my listeners will listen because they love. <laughs> they love the interviews I do. <laughs> well, I'll take that. <laughs> and uh, I, I wish you so much luck uh, with teaching, and I look forward to anything you do in the future with the commentaries or writing with Mel. And I hope you have happy holidays and have a great day. Okay, you too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, there you have it. Steve Haberman. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Steve. You're a very smart guy and very, very intelligent, and you have great knowledge for film, and I appreciate you greatly for taking the time today, sir. Thank you. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!